I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for being here this evening. If some other folks come in, that'll be great. Um, tonight, the subject of uh, this fifth session, fifth session of uh, Sermon on the Mount with Amy Jill Levine is called Finding Your Treasure. Um, and it uh, takes up the teaching of Jesus in the sixth chapter uh, of Matthew into the, just the beginning of the seventh chapter. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at that. Um, hopefully you can see that okay. So let's start with an opening prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Bountiful and generous God, we thank you for giving us this time together to read and reflect on Jesus' teachings. May your spirit help us treasure his words so that we may grow richer in faith toward you and in love toward others. Amen. Amen. I'm going to start with the video this evening um, and then see how that uh, works with our discussion of the uh, passage as we unpack it later. So let me click on the right things here. When Matthew gives us Matthew's version of the Our Father, we have forgive us our debts. So it would not be surprising that the rest of the Sermon on the Mount also had some other economic references. One of them is don't store up treasures on earth where moth and rust can get at them, but store up treasures in heaven. That's actually a banking image, as if we have heavenly bank accounts. And in fact, we do. When we act as God would have us act, we are storing up treasures in heaven. Ancient Judaism suggested that to put coins into the hand of the poor is to offer a sacrifice on the altar. And in times when there was no temple, this was a, a way of dealing with that lack of sacrifice. So you give what you have to somebody else who needs, and that's in fact how you store up treasures in heaven. Don't store them up on earth where moth and rust can get at them. You don't need the second home. You don't need the extra car because somebody else may need just a shelter over his or her head. Somebody else may need transportation to work. Storing up treasures in heaven is not to rack up credits. It's not what my Protestant friends think of as works righteousness. You're not earning a place in the kingdom of heaven. Rather, you're investing in good stewardship, and everybody can appreciate that. It may seem odd to think about fasting as a way of finding one's treasure, because fasting is a sense of denial of the pleasures of the body. But only when we're lacking those treasures, only when we deny ourselves, do we actually come better to appreciate what it means to have. If we don't eat, if we let our bodies go six hours, 12 hours, on Yom Kippur in Judaism, the Day of Atonement, 25 hours without eating, then we truly appreciate that first bite of bread or that first sip of juice that we have. So fasting from ancient times on has been a spiritual discipline. So you deny the body in order to pay attention to other aspects of your life, in order to allow you to recognize what it means to go without and then have greater empathy for those people who lack food sustainability. The point is not, however, to bring yourself to a position of ill health. And the point is certainly not to encourage eating disorders such as anorexia. We don't fast to the point of starvation. Fasting is always temporary. Fasting works as a spiritual discipline. But when fasting becomes an obsession, when fasting becomes a disease or a danger, then we need to step in. I very much appreciate comments about fasting, whether they're in the scriptures of Israel, my own 
Bible or whether they're in the New Testament, because it gives us the opportunity both to speak about food sustainability and also to speak about eating disorders. The texts are there for a reason. Fasting is there for a reason. Use them wisely. Don't abuse them. Every once in a while when I read the Gospels and I listen to the words of Jesus, there's a part of me that wants to respond, really, Jesus, don't worry, are you kidding? But he has a point. Consider the lilies of the field. And at that point, I've stopped worrying because I'm now considering those lilies. How gorgeous they are. What a wonderful smell. King Solomon arrayed in all his glory wasn't as spectacular as that flower. But today that flower is fresh and wonderful. Tomorrow it will have faded. It will be dead. Consider the lilies of the field. Take time to pay attention to what you have. Take time to think about all the beauties of the world. You have enough cares for the day. It's enough. Take the time. The modern idiom, take the time to smell the flowers. It actually makes some sense, because if you just take that little bit of time for a moment, the worry will go away. And if you live in community, if you live out the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, if you live out the scriptures of Israel, if you live the way God intended, you actually not have to worry about things like food or clothing, because your community will provide if you don't have. Whenever we interpret a text, we have to determine what's to be taken literally and what's to be taken as a sort of hyperbolic statement. And we also have to figure out what words mean. When Jesus says, don't judge lest you be judged, Jesus is not saying, therefore, shut down all the courts of justice. When Jesus says, don't judge, Jesus is not saying, yeah, let everything go. It doesn't matter. That's that other person's business, and I'm not going to get in the way. We have to judge because we have to determine what's right and what's wrong. We can't have justice unless we have some form of judgment to tell us what's right and what's wrong. When Jesus says, don't judge, Jesus is basically saying, don't be judgmental. Don't judge other people by a standard that you would not apply to yourselves and recognize it's much easier to condemn somebody else than it is to condemn yourself. That's why he says, stop worrying about taking the splinter out of your neighbor's eye. Get the log out of your own eye first. Do that, and you won't be judgmental. Do that, and you won't be judging according to the wrong standards. One way of thinking about judging, or this idea of measure for measure, or taking the log out of your own eye, this hit home to me in a profound manner at Riverbend Maximum Security Institute, where I've been teaching for close to two decades, in going over this idea of judging, in going over concerns about the unforgivable sin, one of my insider students said, heaven forbid that you would be judged your entire life by the worst thing that you've ever done, a one-time something major mistake. Because for most of the inmates, the insider students at Riverbend, that's how people will think about them. One action as opposed to a lifetime of other types of action. So when we think about not judging, both judging others and indeed judging ourselves, we should not judge ourselves by the worst of our nature or the worst thing we've ever done. We should judge ourselves in a balanced way and hope that we can tip the scales of the balance so that when we look back, perhaps even with a tinge of thanking God, we have been able to stay on that narrow path so that we can be judged and remembered by the good that we have done, not by the worst that we have done. Jesus says, don't worry. I worry. I was born a worrier. My mother worried. Her mother worried. Back to Mount Sinai, the women in my family have worried. And you know what? There's nothing you can do about it. So I worry. And then I think about Jesus saying, don't worry. And I laugh a little bit. Sometimes I just smile. And I think, yeah, that's probably good. If I then I go back to worrying, does it get me anywhere? No. So what substitutes do we have for worrying? Prayer helps. And prayer can be a form of worrying, in fact. Or making a phone call. Or doing something else. Because worry doesn't get you anywhere. Jesus was right. It's easier to say stop worrying than it is to... Stop worrying, but he was right nevertheless. 
I fear today that judging has become a form of entertainment uh, with various cop shows or Judge Judy or Judge whoever it is. And we watch people who are at odds with each other fight it out. And they do it for public entertainment. And then some judge comes in and finds for this side or for that side. I don't think that's what Jesus had in mind, and I don't think that's a fair way of understanding judging. How much better would it have been if instead of having people stand at one side and the other and argue against each other and let some external person judge between them, what would it mean to put on television acts of mediation? That would be a form of peacemaking. That would be a form of being meek. That would be a form of being pure in heart. It might not be entertaining, but it's the right thing to do. When justice becomes a travesty or a laugh, or when justice is only for some and not for others, and when judging becomes a form of entertainment so that we enjoy seeing people fighting it out in the courtroom, perhaps we might remember what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. Make friends with your enemy before you go to court. That's the wiser way of proceeding. Okay, well, that's an introduction into what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, did you have any responses or questions, thoughts that came up as she went through the presentation? Should we just keep our own opinions mm -hmm. to ourselves, and or will we be considered judge being judgmental if we um, disagree and state our disagreement with uh, other people's views on morality and, and or politic politics? Um, is that being judgmental, or should we just keep not say anything and keep our opinions to our and our beliefs to ourselves? Anybody have any thoughts for Linda? I was just going to say, I hope that's not right because I called my senators today. <laughs> I was <laughs> judgmental. <laughs> I know I gave them my opinion is what I did. Really? You know, I think Linda, the, the crux of it is what's the intent of sharing your opinion? Um, we live in a world right now where to share your opinion is to really kind of uh, fashioned by social media and everything else. Um, I share my opinion, I'll pick on myself, I share my opinion without any intent of really listening to or understanding the other person. Um, it's, uh, it's combat. And um, if I can yell louder or if I can insult better or whatever the case is, then, um, then that's judgmental, it seems to me. Um, if we enter into dialogue and, and, and really begin with listening, which is always to listen to the other person and, and say, you know, if Greg and I are talking about something we don't agree, and there was one time Greg and I, you know, disagreed about something. Um, if I say to Greg, okay, let me see if I understand what you're saying, Greg, and then I kind of repeat back what I've heard, and then Greg has a chance to say, yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much what, what, I, what I'm thinking. And then I try to explain myself and Greg can do the same thing. Now we've, now we've entered into actual dialogue. Um, we, we may not resolve our differences. Uh, we may have to walk away, but we'll walk away brothers uh, because we've uh, respected one another. So I, to me, that's the difference. It's, it's, uh, it's not judgmental if I disagree with Greg or Asta, or I never agree, disagree with Asta. <laughs> Never. I don't either. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm not judging you for that. Um, you know, we can we can disagree and we can assert our opinions, but when when somebody says something and it's my opportunity to get them or to. Um, embarrass them or to make my point at their expense in some way, then I think it's judgmental. Does that help at all? Yeah, it does. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, 
it probably doesn't do me any good to try to change somebody's opinion anyway. It's like talking to a wall to a lot of people. I mean, there are some, some people believe a lot differently than I do about things. And, uh, and if I think I'm trying to convert somebody by <laughs> talking about it, I guess I'm yeah. wasting, wasting my breath. Yeah. I think one of the things social media has done, I mean, a lot of folks think it's a place for dialogue and, and the longer I have to mess with it, um, the less I think that's true. There, there's really no intention of dialogue when people get on social media. It's, hey, look at me. Hey, listen to me. And uh, if you don't like what I said, to hell with you. Um, that's kind of what social media is. So it's not really dialogue at all. Um, the, so, you know. People call you names too because of your opinions on things. Oh, sure. Yep, I just try not to call them that back. I mean, at least type it on the screen. <laughs> it's interesting to me that that discussion has kind of become a lost art. It is. Uh, it, in school, I mean, I want to say not that long ago, but actually it was a while ago. <laughs> I mean, you would discuss things and you would debate things and then you'd go to your next class, you know, and, and everything be normal, you know? Yeah, yeah. And today, who? yeah. Yeah, because there's always winners and losers at the end of the argument. Yeah. Um, a discussion doesn't have winners and losers. And I think that's what she was trying to get at in the video. You know, if, if our model was more mediation and peacemaking and reconciliation and that sort of thing. Um, but... I I have a question. When, when she was talking, she's mentioned something. Maybe I, I heard it wrong, which is easy to do. Is uh, did she teach at a, a penitentiary? She said I taught somewhere, and maybe I picked up on it wrong. That she was it a prison, or did she during the thing? She says she is. I couldn't quite understand what you were saying, but she taught at a place, but then she brought up people in prison, kind of for a short bit there. Yeah, she teaches. Uh, she teaches classes at a uh, at a at a penitentiary near Vanderbilt okay. University. Thought I heard it right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just thought it was fascinating. To, you know, the, you know, people that do crimes and then they're spending their time there. Uh, what they think when they resolve that what they've done, and then uh, well, they, they can't get out, so they're going to have to. Is this the one time thing they they have a inner talk to God about, you know, they truly sorry for what they did, but, um, you know, because of the crime on them, they got to spend their crime depending on what it is, but it's the forgiveness part, I guess, is what a struggle is. Yep. Forgiveness and consequences are often two different things. Um, one must pay the consequences for breaking a law. I guess I want to say going back to um, judgment and communication, I think one of the things that are missing today is their ability to listen, to truly honestly listen to yes. what is being said before we form an argument, before we respond. Um, and I think social media, nobody's listening because it's just a rant. And I don't want to, you know, listen to that. But for me, it, it, I'm trying to be more intentional in my listening being an active listener to what's going on around me and what's yeah. being said before I form a judgment. Yep. I mean, I know in the times that I've worked with, uh, say, couples who are struggling with their relationship at some point in time, um, always one of the elements, it seems, to the tension between the couple is that they have either never learned or they, they unlearn um, how to listen to one another. And um, a lot of times it's just you know, some basic ground rules to get them talking again so that they don't keep making accusatory statements like, you know, you make me feel like crap. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, you know, uh, what's better is I, I, I feel really bad when this happens. Um, and, and then the other person can say, so, you know, I mean, but there's got to be dialogue back and forth. Um, and it's got to be not accusatory, 
because uh, that then goes into the winning and losing again. And we're a culture that just values winners and losers. Uh, we value losers because the winners need them <coughs> as fodder. Um, we just create the whole culture. I mean, we steep our, our children in wins and losses through athletics. Um, I, I originally pursued a career in music education and I'm so glad I didn't do that, just personally speaking, um, because I'd be a band director today and that's all been turned into all about trophies and ribbons and that kind of thing. It's not about the art of it. Um, it's did the marching band win the contest? <laughs> I was in marching band because I didn't want to play football. Now you've made them the same thing. <laughs> so um, we're very much that culture. What other things did you hear in the video? Well, let's work through the, the scripture a little bit from this particular um, section and uh, see what kinds of things um, come up as we discuss the scripture. Um, can you see that okay? All right, so um, she started out um, talking about fasting, actually, um, which was part of last week's scripture passages as well. Um, you know, don't screw up your face when you're fasting because you're trying to get something out of it that uh, you're trying to get public recognition and that's not what you do. Um, though she sets up by saying that fasting is a practice that can be spiritually helpful. When you absent yourself from the benefits of, uh, I broke my good glasses the other day and those don't work on Zoom very well. So, uh, you're all out there. Um, so now she, she turns her attention to treasure. Um, Matthew 619 begins, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You probably are familiar with that passage. Um, what have you thought about it in the past? What are you thinking about right now? In the context of finding our treasure in God, in heaven, in following Christ, what does it mean? One of the things a, a New Testament professor of mine um, made sure we understood um, and wrote in a couple of books is um, that last verse there, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And he makes the point that we often turn that inside out. So what we what we say it means to us is that, you know, Whatever I love in my heart, that's, that's what my real treasure is. But that's not what it says. It says, wherever your treasure is, your stuff, your mammon, the things that you've set aside for yourself, that's going to be where your heart is. Jesus is not naive. He understands the allure of stuff. I think the thing we've talked about in the past when we've talked about similar types of scripture is, and maybe this is just a cop out on my part, but, you know, setting aside things for, uh, for the future uh, is something that we all do. If it's a 401k sure. or a pension or a place to live or whatever it is. So, you know, it, is that is that setting aside of that treasure, uh, you know, where, where does that start to lead into, into uh, troubles with this kind of scripture? 
Anybody have any thoughts? I agree with Marty. I mean, at, at some point, I don't know that we can all rely upon God to provide for my health care when I'm 80 or, you know, to pay for my nursing care at that age. So I, we, we do have to essentially store up some of our treasures to take care of ourselves. So that is a fine line. Sure. Do you find anywhere in this passage, I'm sorry, uh, Scott, uh, Diane, did you have something? Well, I just struggle with it from how much should I have, you know, and, and it's kind of on the, on the flip side of giving money to the church, how much should I give? Because I can always give more. I can always, you know. Um, yes, you can. With less. <laughs> But it's, it's a struggle for me, you know, I live in a nice house and I could live in a lot cheaper house if I wanted to and I'd have more money left over to be able to give to the poor or whatever. So what if Jesus here is not prescribing us a formula or to even seek a formula? What if this is a spiritual truth he's teaching us? The first part of it is, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why? Well, moth and rust consume. Thieves break in and steal. All of the things that we store up in this life don't last, right? They are not eternal in nature. Even our pension plans and our savings and our insurance um, is going to go away as we spend, as we use, that sort of thing. So the question in that is, how dependable are they for our salvation? I guess I kind of maybe look at it as a needs, wants type deal. Needs and wants can be helpful here too. We, we need health care when we're 80. We need a roof over our head. We need certain things like that. And as she was talking a while ago, when it comes to the wants, that, that would be, I want a second home in the sunshine during these cold days in January in Iowa. But do we need that? No, perhaps when we get to that point is when we really need to do the outreach and so forth for sheltering the those that don't have even a roof, let alone heat um, during this time. I've, I've given this a lot of thought over the last couple of weeks with <clears throat> single digit and sub-zero temperatures, as yeah. well as hungry with a pandemic and whatnot. We saw a, a clip just a couple of nights ago on the evening news, a couple of young kids going to, it was a pantry type thing, but it was set up by locals for it just broke my heart to see kids that are hungry um, in this environment that maybe they would not otherwise be absent the pandemic so then you throw in the cold out the elements and the hungry is really where i think we all need to do some self-reflection and see what our needs are and when we have what we need to just do some godly work with down those other avenues. I think one of the things that she also, that I heard her say is that um, as we help our neighbor, as we do things, these other people like Brad was just saying, the food pantry and, and all these other, um, that's where our heart is and that's also part of our treasure, if you will, that we can uh, build up, if you will, or store for our heavenly goal, if you want to use that word, but, um, as opposed to having other just like financial things here um, on, on earth. Well, we, we all have different talents too, um, and different abilities, things that we can do to serve God and not necessarily financially, but there's there's things that we can do um, 
with our talents that show service to God. The other piece that, that Levine brings out of these passages, as always, is the deeply Jewish context of Jesus' teachings. Um, and they're also rooted in community, which is hard for us to think of because we're such individualists. You know, there is an element, as she said in her teaching, that, that reminds us that one of the reasons we put the offering uh, out there for the food pantry, for instance, which is as if we were giving an offering to God, um, is because we're part of a community and see our neighbor as our responsibility. And we do so trusting that this community will then also take care of us if we have needs. Now, I know that's a, that's a long shot bet in the United States of America and many other places, right? Um, but um, nevertheless, uh, Jesus calls us to live in the kind of community that supports one another um, and is there for one another. Um, you know, Marty, uh, as far as how much is it that, that we get to keep and how much we give, I guess that's, you know, for me, that's been a, a, a self-reflection every day. Um, and then at the end of the day, I have to just rejoice that I've been able to share. Um, and then I have to reflect and be honest with myself on whether um, I'm letting my wants get control of my needs. You know, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm with I think you. The thing, I, I need, you know. Yeah, you just don't want to live your life in one long guilt trip. <laughs> yeah, and, and and I don't think. I mean, I don't think Jesus is doing that. Yeah. We can turn it into that because we're very good guilt machines. Jesus is saying, if you put all your trust in the things of this world, they will be taken from you, some way or another. If nothing else, like the man in the parable in Luke, who says, look, now I've had a good crop and I build bigger barns and now I'm, you know, can eat, drink and be merry. And then he dies. I think the possessions, get your stuff. the possessions can end up possessing us. <laughs> exactly. What possesses what? I think part of it, too, is your, I mean, we're talking about where your heart is, um, your attitude toward your possessions. Um, I, I remember when I was growing up, you know, you'd see somebody go out and they'd buy a new car and they were really proud of the new car. And, you know, they wash it quite often and, and just were really proud of it. And I remember one time when my dad bought a new car and my sister took it for a drive and came home and there was a dent in it and she, you know, she was really worried because uh, I mean, it was the first day he had it home, and she had stopped at my uncle's and asked my uncle to come down and be with her when she told dad, and she was really worried. And and they told dad, and he just kind of shrugged his shoulders and he said, "That's what insurance is for." <laughs> didn't get mad, didn't you know? Wasn't upset, uh, but you know, to him it was a utility thing. It wasn't a yeah. A really pride thing and uh, everything was fine. <clears throat> I think we always have to be just careful that we don't take the teachings of Jesus as uh, laws. Um, Jesus comes to fulfill the law. He doesn't come to set up new laws for us to worry about whether we've fulfilled or not. Um, he comes also to set us free. And so what he wants to set us free of, and we all know this is absolutely true. We live in a, in a society, a culture at a time in history when our stuff has a very powerful hold over us. And that our stuff can keep us from being the really godly people that we are called to be. You know, we have those struggles all the time. And Jesus is reminding us that the struggle is real. So where do we get the help? Well, we fast to remind ourselves that hunger is A, something that doesn't kill us, and B, that other people suffer as well, and so I'm called to help them. We pray. We offer up our guilt 
um, our questions to God, who is a God of grace and forgives us. We stay in community to get together so that we know that we don't have to go it alone in this life. Along with all of the other things that Jesus teaches us. So I don't think his teaching here is intended to give us a bunch of grief. I think it's intended to give us a burden, as he says, that is easy, a yoke that is light. Love the things of heaven because they'll never be taken away from you. There is the good news of this passage. They're yours eternally. Let's move on. Extending that, no one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Wealth here, I agree with Levine, is a terrible translation in the NRSV. Um, the Aramaic word is mammon, which, um, which actually um, has more to do with kind of a perverse blessing. Um, and so it has this sense in which good things that good things that aren't so good when you get right down to it. And again, this just extends the discussion that we were having just a minute ago. So five ways to find true treasure, two of them associated with this teaching Levine gives us. Faithful fasting. Clean out your closets. Don't be a hoarder. Um, you know, fast and feel hunger when that's healthy for you to do. Um, do that in a way that gives you empathy for others who are hungry and demonstrates to you that you don't have to sell your soul to the devil uh, in order to have a ham sandwich. Um, faithful fasting. Um, giving up those things that become the treasures that we cling to in some way or another. And then mastering mammon. Uh, being in charge of your possessions instead of being by, possessed by them. And like discipleship, this is a lifelong thing. Jesus is not characterizing here. Here's seven tips. This is not self-help. Here's seven tips that if you do these seven things, then you'll never have this struggle again. <laughs> it's not the way discipleship works. This is the way your days are going to go as a follower of Jesus. A constant struggle to master the mammon in your life and a way of using fasting to set your priorities. He then goes on to talk uh, about the eye. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Five ways to find treasure, the lamp of the body. And what do you think Jesus is saying here? It's a spiritual metaphor. It's not literal. So the lamp is the eye of the body. Total guess. But is it like the outlook that you choose to take and the way you choose to look at things? I, I think that certainly works for me as, as one way of looking at this. Um, you know, what is it that you spend your time looking at? Focusing on, giving your attention to. If, if, if it is things that are full of joy and eternal life and God and and community and love, then your eye will be bright. We all know we can also focus on things that dim the lights, right? I, I think it's kind of like the, um, uh, I just lost my train of thought, but like the thought word indeed, our thoughts have having consequences and so forth. And when we have the doubt yep. or the tempter gets in there, it's kind of like a wandering eye. 
when the tempter kind of has us staring this way and we know we should be looking ahead rather than over here. Yeah, I'm a, um, I'm a, I'm a fan of C.S. Lewis's uh, classic work, The Screwtape Letters. Um, and um, screw tape in that it's it's an it's an interesting book to read because you always have to remember that the main character is a devil, but the devil speaks very in this book speaks very rationally and uses the the humanness of our lives to do exactly what you're talking about, Brad. Uh, the tempter gets us to look at something else to be distracted so that we're distracted away from God. Um, Back to the social media conversation, the lack of dialogue, partisan politics. Um, to me, it is not a stretch at all to say screw tape. Uh, the demon is very much at work making sure that we humans are tallying up our winners and losers so effectively that we can get absolutely nothing good done as a people. Make sure that we count score and, and do the accounting all the time. And then we will, as, a, as humanity, end up killing one another. That's the evil impulse. Um, the diversion is every commercial that you look at, every, um, just the way the whole economy is set up. And I'm not suggesting that we overthrow it. I'm not, you know, um, I don't have a set of nice mittens that I sit outside and, you know, um, go to inaugurations with. I'm, I'm not that much of a socialist, although I am a little bit of one. Um, but the, the whole way that capitalism and market economics works is by getting us to want stuff that we don't have. And if that's all you look at, the stuff that you don't have, you will conclude finally that, that there is no light in the world. It's all dark because I don't have what I want instead of giving thanks for what I have. All right, here's the big one. Scandinavian, German, American type folks. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. What you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Or Tim does, walking out in the snow and feeding the little critters again. Are you of not more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? Fair question. And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow. Among the many things that I'm, if I ever got a tattoo, I might consider putting on as a tattoo. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. So, how are we all doing with the worry thing? It's all part of our human nature. We just worry. We do. I think it ties back into our earlier discussion about how you use your treasure. You know, we, we worry about the future. You worry about setting things aside so that you 
you know, you, you have enough to survive or live on in the future. Uh, so it, it's a uh, it's a challenging text. It is, and yet, and yet, on the other side of the coin, as she says, a really simple text. Um, it's it's sort of like simple can still be challenging. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't mean it's complex. Yeah. It's like the message of the manna from, you know, from the wandering in the wilderness that, you know, I'm going to give you enough for today. And that, and then, and then when you try to accumulate more, it's just going to get rotten. So, <laughs> I mean, we get it, we kind of have, we are told these messages over and over and over again, but we must not learn it very well because you were told it again, right? Well, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting story to think of, Asta. I think um, one of the things I reflect on that text that is always a, a challenging teaching is that if you collected more than you needed, it went rotten and you couldn't, you know, you couldn't use it. Um, so then my question becomes, in, in, my, in my struggle, in my worry to accumulate what I need, what I've convinced myself I need, when I store it up, what goes bad? What, what is the cost to me? Um, how have I injured my soul in those ways? And I think that's the other side of the coin to your question, Marty. We do have to, to, to plan. We do have to set aside, you know, we, the way our culture is set up. If I don't have money in the bank when I retire, um, we're going to have to eat the same as the dog. You know, we're going to be eating dog food. Um, so we need to have that care. The, the question is, how much does that concern and anxiety enter into my life and dictate things rather than the trust that, you know, well, whatever I could put away is going to have to be enough, you know, um, and to balance that with, I, I also need to make sure that I can do the good deeds, the good works, the the sharing and community and that sort of thing. So, you know, it's this balance that I have to live in. And not to worry about it. Right. And, and how does that all foot with when, like Lane was saying, I think it, it is human nature to worry when, it's, when what, the absolute surrender or total surrender and one of the most reoccurring messages and themes throughout scripture is fear not. First and foremost, the, 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 uh, the largest number of things God commands, the one thing that God commands the most times in scripture is do not be afraid or fear not. And why is that? Here's the simple truth. And this is simple. Because you're a beloved child of God, and nobody can ever take that away from you. My grandmother told a story about when she was um, she was an, an immigrant when she was a, a very young girl and and uh, my grandfather or her I mean her my great grandfather lost his job her father lost his job because he was sick and couldn't work and so they were down to their last cup of flour basically and and she remembered she was probably like six years old or something but her her mother taking her on her lap and taking her, her little brother on her lap and praying over and over again in Danish, <laughs> give us this day our daily bread, give us this day our daily bread. And yeah, it was just a matter of a short time that the neighbors that lived around them just kind of sensed the plight they were in and began to provide for them and, and gave them food and help them be able to live through the, until, until he was able to go back to work and and earn money again. Yep. Um, so it was it was always kind of a family example for us of, of <laughs> what you know that that um, you know not that, that instead of worrying she she took it to God you know. Yeah. Prayer is the way you deal with it in some ways. I mean there's other things we do too but but it was also that sense of the community. The community is what you know, that's kind of what she was saying, too, that, yes. that um, you know, that's part of the heavenly bank account she was talking about. You know, one of the things that uh, Martin Luther's reforms included, which he doesn't always get a lot of press for, 
um, is uh, he was the inventor in, in uh, uh, the town in Germany that they lived uh, and it spread throughout. Um, he was the inventor of the, the community chest, um, which was a common place where people put offerings and money in so that those who were in need would have uh, support when they fell on hard times. Um, and it bled out into all kinds of other social ministries. You know, down the road, the Lutheran Deaconess community becomes part of that with health and that sort of thing. Um, Christians, at their best throughout time, have taken the idea of community and, and, and being for one another um, very seriously. Um, and we right now live in a, in a culture that doesn't have any idea how to do that. Um, and so who does it fall to? Um, to teach, once again, the bonds of community where charity and love prevail, um, where, um, where we take care of one another. Um, and it will take a great revolution, I think, in our hearts and minds to live in the tension that this text is giving us so that we can have those resources. But, you know, at Holy Trinity, we've come a long way. Um, we've, we've got a food pantry. Um, we, we've, we've got money that we give to thrive and impact to help people who are uh, down and out and, and don't have anybody else to turn. We, we've, we've connected with other mission partners. There are free stores and there are uh, family promise um, organizations um, who are trying to build the community, the beloved community that Christ saw. Um, so it's out there, but it's hard to trust because we live in a world that is, many of the forces in our world are just trying to tear it apart as we talked earlier in the night. And the bottom line is today's trouble is enough for today. I think of St. Augustine also when I think of this, Augustine very clearly for a guy in the fifth century knew a lot about time. We think that that's something that, you know, we understand because of quantum mechanics and all of that relativity and that sort of thing. Augustine's teaching is that first off, the past does not exist. And second, the present does not exist. They are projections into the present moment. So all you can do is turn to the future and worry about it, imagine it, think what it might be, and all you can do with the past is turn around and interpret it through today. And you end up being a bad interpreter, as so many historians will testify, because you think of it as being nostalgic and, you know, it was great back then and all that kind of stuff. Well, it's gone. The challenge here is to live in the present moment. And we rob ourselves of all kinds of joy because we're too busy worrying about the past and thinking about a future that isn't here yet. Don't worry about tomorrow. Whatever's gonna to happen tomorrow will happen. It's gonna be cold. <laughs> What's that? And it's, it's gonna be cold. It's gonna be cold, <laughs> yeah. If the prognosticators are right, you know, and it's it's Iowa, so tomorrow we could walk outside and be, you know, have another derecho in 80 degrees. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. My dad, as he got older, would watch the Weather Channel for hours. And maybe some of you do the same thing. I never found it terribly entertaining. And I used to give him a bad time. I'd say, Dad, just open the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> right right next to the TV, you know. So a fourth way to find true treasure is to keep our worry at bay as much as we possibly can and to enjoy the things that are right in front of us. And yet. <laughs> I got to get this guy to let go of the worry. Yep. What, yes, Mark. <laughs> I think we have to be careful that we don't use that as a way to shirk responsibility. Oh, to sure. Say, to say, you know, we're not going to worry about it. We'll let, I'll let Mark worry about it. I don't need to worry about it. Uh, you know, so I, there, there's, 
we've used the word balance a lot tonight. And I think that that is uh, an appropriate word. I also think there's a big difference between planning responsibly and worrying. Mm -hmm. Worrying has a whole bunch more emotional baggage with it that chews us up from the inside out. Yeah, it's one if thing. I, to, oh, sorry. Go ahead. It's one thing to prepare, and you exactly. can worry that you didn't prepare enough, but that doesn't do anything for you. Right. So, you know, just do what you can, prepare, and, uh, but for the folks who, who don't prepare, they just, and they don't worry. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, they're really counting on somebody, somebody else. And yep. And that's a, that's a whole different spiritual issue. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I agree with you. I, you know, I just uh, being prepared. Um, you know, living responsibly. Jesus isn't telling anybody not to do that. Right. Right. Uh, Go, going to Walmart and buying one package of toilet paper is planning. <laughs> buying seven or more yes there you go um we've we've <laughs> we've fallen off the preparation truck right into a big vat of worry um anxiety um fear well said well the last piece here is about judgment do not judge so that you may not be judged or with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. The last one is do not judge to find true treasure. Um, judgmental people feel judged. Shocking. It's a practice that eats away at our innards. As Levine said in the video, you know, it's not that we don't make judgments courts and laws and all of those kinds of things have to have somebody making some judgments. Um, it's, the, it's the moral judgments that break relationships that we're talking about here. It's the keeping score again and the winning and the losing again um, that, um, that seem to be at, at the point here. Um, and you know, the church has struggled ever since its inception um, to not be a bunch of people saying, well, we are all right, but those people over there, they're, they're going to hell. Not that there's any of that around anymore. <laughs> How does this relate to the don't worry and, and to the to the being, to, to where your light shines or where it falls. I think sometimes judging becomes an excuse for not doing something. Yeah. Those, yep. people, don't, those people don't deserve it. So why should I share with them? Exactly, exactly, yep. Yeah, because if we really believe the, uh, the radicalness of God's declaration that we are all, every creature is a beloved creature of God, um, that you can't look into the eyes as the women of the ELCA, I shared it on our Facebook page, um, beautiful artistic face of a woman. It says you can never look into anybody's eyes and not see a child of God. Um, and we, it's, it's easy to try to forget that, to wiggle out from under that. But then think of the cost on the other side. You've now created a place in which you cannot be a child of God. Well, 
One of the saddest stories I ever encountered in my ministry was a was a, a, a father and son um, who had become very estranged from one another. The, the son came out as being gay and uh, the father threw him out of the house um, violently and, um, you know, struggled to accept him and said the church couldn't accept him and all this kind of stuff. And he burned all these bridges um, only to have it come out later that um, he himself had been struggling with his sexuality all life all his life and was gay too. But because he'd done this to his son, now he was judged by the same law that he made. Went to his grave without reconciling with the son, you know? So the judgment that we place on others makes us then culpable to the same judgment. That's one of the things Jesus is trying to say here. So I love that Levine has kind of said, look, um, fast in a healthy way to remind yourself of your needs instead of your wants, right? Make sure you manage your mammon so that it doesn't manage you, okay? Be careful about what you're concentrating on. Here's another part of judgment that I hadn't made until I watched this um, and read the chapter. Um, Judgment is a lot about what we let our eye fall on in another person. You know, so why is it that you pick that out to notice about them instead of the fact that there's all these other wonderful things about them? Um, and then um, what was the fourth one? Dummy. Anyway, and then do not judge. Oh, don't worry and don't judge. Um, let, let today's trouble be enough for itself. Don't, by worrying, you can't extend your life any, any at all. Now, by preparing, as we talked earlier, you can, you know, you can be like the squirrel who puts away nuts for the winter, and that's a good thing, you know. I'm sure Jesus approves of that. Um, but, um, but at the same time, uh, if, the, if the squirrel is uh, going to have an apoplectic fit um, as he sits and counts all his nuts and says, oh, it's not enough, it's not enough, it's not enough, he's going to have a heart attack um, before he gets to eat any of them. I don't know if squirrels actually have heart attacks. I would assume so. And then finally, do not judge because you're going to be judged yourself. And, and why look at the bad when you can look at a good person? Well, let's close with a prayer. The Lord be with you. Be with you. Holy Spirit, ever guide us and strengthen us to seek first the kingdom of heaven and God's righteousness so that we may receive from God's open hands all true treasure as well. For the sake of Jesus, our teacher and Lord. Amen. 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 Well, thanks, everybody. We'll finish this up with the last session next week which is called, let me make sure, yes, Living Into the Kingdom. Um, and then uh, during Lent, we'll have a four-part series um, that is focused on the stained glass windows at our church. Um, and we'll be part of the School of Love and what those windows teach us about loving God, loving neighbor, and loving creation. So um, that is if the developer of that particular thing can, you know, actually come up with something. <laughs> we won't judge until later <laughs> yes don't judge me later yeah. yep. don't judge me till later knows we're gonna worry about it yeah, yeah. i'm not gonna worry about it i'm just gonna do what i know to do and i'm a young guy so you can't expect that much so all right everyone thank you very much for being here tonight and um Oh, I'm sorry. I had that on share that whole time. Well, I guess that's all right. 
So um, we'll be together next week. If you have any questions or concerns, let me know. If you need to look at past um, sessions because you missed them, they're on the website under adult learning um, and uh, on YouTube. So I'll get this one posted just as quick as I can if you want to share it with anybody else. Okay? Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Be blessed and be well.